So now let's start with one very important uh, uh, concept in human resource management, which is talent acquisition. Some would say recruiting. Yeah. Well, I prefer this term talent acquisition because I divided this into two parts. One thing is how do we get the people into the door? How can we attract people? And the other thing is we're going to talk about this in the upcoming session. How can we select the right people? And to me, these are two different stories. Attracting people, bringing people into the door, because this is a major challenge for many companies, especially as we have learned for bottleneck functions. And the other thing is how to select the right people. Okay. So this is our focus. I will start showing you the traditional approach of recruiting or talent acquisition, uh, which is primarily about ads. Okay. We'll see. This is the textbook style of recruiting. Very simple. This is what, you, what comes to your mind when we think about how to hire people. But then, the major part within this chapter, we will look at some modern approaches. I've shown you last session that most companies really suffer from a significant talent shortage. Yeah. And it will be more traumatic in the future. Okay. So talk about what can companies do to hire talented people, to attract talented people. And one very important concept is the so-called employer brand. You know what a brand is? We're going to talk about this. Ah, it's a promise. Huh? So employer brand is what does a company really promise to those people that should apply for this company? We'll talk about some search strategies, I mean active search strategies. What is that? An ad, a job ad, a job advertisement is rather passive, you know? It's passive because you just post an ad and then you wait for the applications to come. It's passive. Yeah? Well, here it's about active search strategies. For example, in Germany, it would be the platform Xing. Right. <coughs> That's where companies can find their employees or interesting employees for them. Yeah, we have social media. We can <coughs> Sorry. We have social media platforms like, like Xing or pro probably, you know, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, LinkedIn is more the global platform it's, it's more or less the same yeah. so companies more and more enter these platforms and actively search for people and then approach these people this is active yeah um, why is it required to be active because the best candidates are passive we're going to talk about this concept of passive candidates a talented well-qualified motivated employee is rather passive in a sense that he or she is not looking for a job. Yeah? Once you get employed, you're going to be passive. I hope you're going to be satisfied in your job. You're going to be happy. So if you're happy in your job, if you're doing well, you're going to be a passive candidate. You will not go to career fairs. You will not even look at the, the, the job ads. You're going to be passive. The best people are rather passive. So once we have met promising candidates, former interns, for instance, how can we build a relation to these people? How can we retain promising, talented candidates? So this is what we're going to talk about. Okay. Um, let me start with a more traditional approach. Um, before we do this, some comments on... There are, of course, always two alternatives in recruiting. Uh, the first alternative is that you have internal hirings. Yeah, just imagine you have a quantitative workforce demand. You have an open position or a vacancy, as we name it. One thing is you can hire people from the internal. Okay? You take an existing employee and hire him or her. And the other path is external hiring, hiring people from the outside. Okay. 
The only message I want to share with you on this, and this is quite obvious, is that there is not the one best way. We can't say that external hiring is better than internal hiring or vice versa. There are some pros and cons related to both strategies. For instance, if you hire from external, whenever you hire people from the external, you bring in new ideas, new perspectives, yeah? uh, you have maybe more options because there are more people outside than inside. Must not always be the case. Yeah? But on the other hand, it's a much higher uh, integration effort. Yeah? If you hire people from the external, these new employees must, must cope with a new situation, with a new culture, with the new processes and all this stuff. So it needs a significant integration. We have higher turnover. Yeah? Once you hire people from external, the probability that they leave in the first few months is much higher than when you hire somebody from internal. Okay? Um, just take home that there are these two paths and uh, there are some pros and cons related to both. Okay? So, this is the traditional way of talent acquisition. Posting an ad. Where, where can you post an ad? Where? In the newspaper, right. Where else? TV. TV. TV? Yeah, you can, yeah. yeah. You, you rarely find job ads on TV. But but internet. Yeah. Sorry? Internet sites. Internet sites. Social media. Social media. Newspaper. Newspaper. Um, on buses. Buses. Yeah. Any kind of advertising. Yeah. Everywhere, yeah. yeah. At the universities. At universities. Yeah. So there are many, many places where companies can post ads, of <laughs> course. Uh, maybe the most important places where companies post ads are their career websites, of course, yeah, their own career websites. Uh, another concept, I will not talk about this concept in more detail because you know what these are. Chop boards. Can you give me a name of a, a chop board? Monster. Monster, yeah. Please visit monster. Monster.com. Yeah. Hot chops and so on. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, any type of newspaper, okay? So, this is how job ads look like. I don't have to tell you what a job ad is. Just indicating real quick what are the typical elements of a job ad. What we have nowadays on modern job ad is an employee value proposition. We're going to talk about this concept in much detail in the upcoming session. But uh, at this point, it's a promise. Yeah, look at this ad from Adidas. Um, what is written there? I can't read it. <laughs> Shape the future of sport. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Something like this. That's a promise. The promise tells you, oh, if I work at Adidas, I will shape the future of sports. Yeah, that's a promise. Okay, with pictures and everything. Then, of course, the job title, job ID, ID location. <coughs> uh, what we find more and more is a usage of social media in job ads. So here in this case, you can, you can click on, on a link, which is share this. And then a window appears. And then you can click on Facebook. Once you click on this, you know what happened. You're going to share this ad with your friends. Okay? Or you can Twitter it. You can post it on your LinkedIn profile. The idea is that once people find a job ad quite attractive, they, they communicate it. They share it. Yeah? They spread it. And some companies hope that they get a kind of viral effect on this. It rarely happens, but at least it's an it's a idea which became more and more popular. Okay. We haven't had these things uh, five years ago. Then, of course, tasks and responsibilities and all these things. Some companies also communicate 
attractive points, attractive aspects. What makes this job attractive? Why is it a great job? Um, to add one comment here, I used to show such an ad to, to <coughs> managers when I do presentations. And I used to tell them that, you know, this is really the exact, this is exactly the wrong way of posting an ad. Why? Hard question, I tell you. What companies used to do, and you will find a lot of examples, for instance, on monster.com, most companies communicate requirements. Yeah? What does the company require from an applicant? It's a wish list. Right? It's a wish list. So, and they assume that people want to work there, all people want to work at Adidas, so they look at this, this job ad, and then they screen the requirement. And when you still feel that you can meet all these requirements, you will apply. And these companies assume that all people want to work there. But this is no more the case for most companies because there is a talent shortage. So what more and more companies do instead is they do not really put their requirements on front. They put in front why this job is attractive. Yeah. So this is one thing we're going to talk about when it comes to employer branding. I think in the future, companies will 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 uh, reduce the communication of requirements, but will rather argue why why a job is attractive. They have to sell the job. Okay. Um, there is another alternative, and this is not really talent acquisition, but it is related to this somehow. It's contingent workforce, um, to put it simply. It's not always required to hire people. Sometimes you can simply, let's say, rent people. Okay, this is one alternative. Uh, I put it there because... You, you have to understand this idea, you have to understand this concept, and I want to spend five minutes really to, to explain this real quick. What's the idea? There is a supplier on the left-hand side, and there is a company, a client on the right-hand side. Uh, there are contingent workforce agencies like Manpower. Go to their website. Uh, manpower, one, one word, manpower.com. This is a typical supplier. Uh, and they employ contract workers. Yeah? They have employees. Yeah? And these employees, the contract workers, get their salary from the supplier. They have an employment contract. It's just like the contract workers would work at this company. But the special point is that the contract workers in, uh, in, 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 in uh, here, they do not really work for the supplier, they work for the client. Yeah? Let's say there is a company like Siemens, and Siemens is building a plant somewhere, and Siem Siemens has a demand about 60 workers for something. Yeah? They simply rent these this contract workers. These workers do not work for manpower in that case. They work for Siemens. They do their job at Siemens. Yeah? And they get direction from Siemens. Siemens tell these people what to do. They, 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 they guide them. Yeah? The contract worker shows a performance for this company. Yeah? But they get the salary from, from the contingent workforce <coughs> agents. Okay? And between here, in this case, manpower and Siemens, there is, of course, an agreement about multiple things, and Siemens is paying a fee to the supplier. Okay? This is, um, in a few words, the fundamental idea of contingent workforce. Now, just a question. If the contract workers earn, let's say, 10 10 euro an hour. How much will the company pay to the supplier? 
more than 10 euros. More than 10. How, how much? I would say 20. 20, exactly. Yeah? As a rule of thumb, yeah? it's twice as much. So the company pays 20 euro to the supplier and the contract worker at the end gets 10 euro. Why? Why do companies <coughs> do this? I mean, they could easily hire these contract workers, pay, let's say, 15 euro, and they would be better off. It takes much less time to get the contract workers than oh, to yes. hiring people. Yeah, it's much more easy to, to simply rent the workers. You can have them immediately. Yeah. But there is a certain problem. I worked for such a company, I worked for Randstadt, which is Randstadt. the concept. Yeah, it's the same concept. But the thing is, uh, in these companies, people come and go like every week. I heard from the workers, they are so frustrated because they have to teach their new workers. I was there for a few weeks, yeah. so I could learn and do the job. But some people change after a day. So yeah. the companies m may have some profit <coughs> from it, but on the other side, they get all the time new workers who don't know the job. Loyalty is, uh, is low. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then if you hire those people and you need them for one project, you can't get rid of them. Yeah. Right, yeah. You hire these and you, you don't need them anymore, you can't get rid of them. Yeah. So it's about flexibility. Yeah, companies are ready, willing to pay money just to have flexibility. Okay. Let's start with some uh, more, uh, continue with some more methods. Career fairs. I mean, you all know what a career fair is, right? Uh, we even have one on our campus once a year, the so-called campus day. The idea is simply, companies come, they have their stand, their booth, and present the jobs, the offers. Um, so that's it. Um, but let me let me share some 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 comments on this. Uh, if I ask companies, <laughs> employers, does it really pay off to spend days at a career fair? Does it really pay off? I mean, you have the booth, you have to pay for, the, for this, you, you, you spend days here. Yeah. Um, yeah, does that pay off? The answer is <coughs> probably no. So the question is, why do, com why do companies do this? Yeah. Uh, and why, why, why don't they work as, as, uh, as expected? So you need to understand some points here. Yeah. Um, of course, there, there, is, there is the advantage that companies can get in direct touch with employees, uh, with future employees. We can have a direct communication, but this is rather a benefit for you, yeah, as graduates or students, than for the companies. Yeah, I mean, for you, it's really an advantage, and I really would recommend you to visit career fairs. Yeah, but when you go there, for instance, to the Absolventen Congress to Cologne, you should go there. Really, have a plan. Yeah, have a target list of companies which you want to visit and be prepared and have a one-page CV <coughs> with you, yeah? okay? Have maybe some questions prepared which you want to address at the different companies. If you, do, if you act like this, you can really benefit because you can get in direct contact to the company, to people. Uh, if you go on a <coughs> website, on a career website of, of large corporations, you will hardly find names on it. You will not find email addresses on, on website. You will not find any email address on the website of Deutsche Bank. Yeah? Never. Never, never, never. But here, you can exchange business cards, you can shake hands, you can have a chat, and then you can link to this person by a LinkedIn or Xing, or so you can build relations on this. This is an, an, an advantage for you, primarily. Yeah? More and more companies do some kind of immediate pre-selection. It's, it's, you will hardly find this in Germany, but in some countries it can happen. Uh, you go to the booth, you have a conversation, interview, and if it's all well, yeah, you go to the separé, have a latte macchiato, and sign the contract. Yeah. Okay. That happens in some countries, rarely in Germany. 
good point also for you is there that you really can compare. Yeah? You can compare KPMG with PwC, with Ernst & Young. They are all there and you can talk to these different companies all in once, more or less. Yeah? Uh, if you want to go to the automotive industry, okay, there is Audi and there is BMW. You go to Audi, you talk to them, you go to BMW and talk to them, then you go to Daimler and talk to them. You can compare. That's, for, for you, that's, that's really great. Yeah? But the point for the companies is that they really have only limited contact to passive candidates or passive seekers. I will come to this concept more uh, later. But at this point, I just said that the best people in the labor market, they have a job. They don't need to go there. Yeah? They are passive. The people who go there are those which are maybe students, it's fine, or they are unemployed, they are desperate, mm -hmm. huh? maybe. Huh? Uh, but these are not primarily those people the companies want to meet. You know? And if you are on such a fair as a company, and I spent a lot of days on these fairs, um, you know, you have maybe 100 contacts a day. And 90%, 90 contacts are, I want to say useless, yeah, because every human connection is useful somehow. Yeah? <laughs> but not in a sense that you really want to hire people. And to be honest, really, uh, sometimes you stand on the booth and, and you look at some person uh, passing by and you think, oh, I hope this person don't want to talk to me. <laughs> oh, hello. Uh, and you, these people are trained how to get rid of people, how to run a conversation that it will end definitely after two minutes. Because you don't want to... Uh, you don't want to lose time uh, talking to a person very definitely. You know, you will never ever hire this person, a gardener. Yeah, they want to apply a fifty-year-old gardener who found out that he or she has a talent for a software development or something like this. And is it, uh, what? Uh, but you are, as a company, you're passive. You're waiting for the people to come, and you can't really approach people. You cannot really approach those people you want to meet. Okay, so this is really. This is really a, a downside. That's why companies more and more also offer additional services to attract the people they want to attract. Yeah? For you, it's great. For the company, it's, um, it's of, let's say, limited, of limited benefit. But, but why, why, why do companies go there, even though the benefit is rather limited? When you said that only 90 of those 100 contacts are useless, so I suppose that the other 10 will be uh, yeah. useful. And yeah, there are 10 which are quite useful. Maybe there is one person which you're going to hire at the end, and if you make this, uh, it pays off. Yeah. Sometimes it pays off. Yeah. Maybe it's good publicity because there's always yeah. going to be a newspaper report. It's about publicity. It's about public relation. I mean, I, I told you, uh, uh, I worked for SAP and I was responsible for recruiting globally. And we always asked ourselves, should we go to that fair? And the answer was always, we have to. <coughs> because it would be a bad message to public or to the labor market if SAP would not be there. That would mean that doesn't SAP hire employees? Doesn't SAP go well, or is there any problem? So you have to be there just to be there, yeah? to show the world you are still there, yeah? and you do well. Yeah? Okay. So for a company like Audi, they couldn't stand to say, well, there is BMW, there is Daimler, there is Porsche, all these companies, but we are not. Uh, they rarely expect such a situation, uh, accept such a situation. Okay. A next concept which you should know is what we name executive search. Yeah. Maybe you have heard this term headhunter. Uh, 
Um, you might have an idea about what that really means. But let me let me explain what it really means. Okay. Uh, executive search means that you, as a company, you do not only hire. It's not only your effort to hire people. You work together with a, a consulting firm. You work together with an agency. And this agency, this consulting firm, helps you. Uh, to find the right people, okay? And executive search, in German, Personalberatung. Yeah. They used to fill executive positions. So, so when we talk about really uh, top-level positions for executive boards, <coughs> Vorstände, managing directors, general manager, sometimes you will find ads, okay? in some leading uh, terms like, like Zeit, uh, Economist, or so, you will find an ad sometime, but this is only a small proportion proportion of all these positions, positions which, which are about to, to be filled. Okay. Most positions on these levels are filled through executive search. In most cases, <coughs> secretly. Yeah. The other people in the company do not really know that the company currently is looking for a new executive. Yeah. Sometimes even the current job owner, the current job in company does not know that the company is looking for a new person. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would recommend that um, you visit some websites of the leading executive search consultancies. Um, Probably the biggest one, um, the leading one is Egon Sender International. Go to their website. A very powerful company. Yeah. Uh, all of the consultants at this consultancy are former executives. Yeah. Um, Heitrich and Stradl, Russell Reynolds, Corn Ferry, and Germany Keenbaum. These are the very famous globally operating executive search firms. Yeah. Again, go to their website. You get a little bit of spirit, a sense of, of, of how they act and, and uh, what they promise. Now, let's have a real example. <coughs> give, me, give me a name of any company you like. BMW. BMW, okay. Now, let's assume, <coughs> just assume, BMW is looking for a new CFO. Okay. Chief Financial Officer. Question number one. How much does a Chief Financial Officer earn in a year? Million. Sorry? Millions. Million? Okay. Million. Uh -huh. 20,000 in a week. <laughs> 4,000 in a day. 400 in an hour. Okay, other guesses? 1 million? Hmm? Less? Who says less? Who says more? Okay. Ah, that's good. Yeah, I would agree. A million, should be fair. Yeah, let's say about a million. Yeah. Now, if a company like BMW is looking for a new CFO, you will hardly find an ad. Yeah, it is, they won't do this. Um, they will work with an executive search firm. And the question is now, how many does the executive search firm earn to help this company finding the new CFO? Uh, I've indicated here it's one third. Yeah? 333,000 euro. <coughs> That's a lot. <laughs> yeah? Just for helping the company to fill this particular position. And especially for BMW. I mean, it's an easy game to find a CFO for BMW. <laughs> yeah? Here. Yeah. 33%. What you need to know, and this is special about this entire business, if, if BMW 
engages in executive search firms as well, Egon Sander, or Heitrich Struggle, please help us to find the CFO, even when they, st when they stop doing this search because they found an internal candidate, they will pay. Okay? This is what we also call a retained search. You will pay. If you engage an executive search company, independent from any result, independent from w where the journey goes to, yeah, you pay one-third of the total target annual salary. Okay? That's special. And in most cases, they don't use ads, as I said. They, they do active search. What does that mean, active search? That means that, that these companies, they have researchers, people, which do nothing else than just search the market. Yeah? They spend a lot of time in the internet. They have huge databases about people. Yeah? Whenever you talk with an executive search consultant, yeah, they <coughs> always ask you about people in your company. Who is reporting to whom? What is the name of uh, Okay, and we'll uh, make notes. They always collect names. So once it comes to the situation that they, that they have to fill a position, they always <coughs> have this backup. They have, they have these databases from where they can tell uh, which person might fit to this particular position. Okay? This is executive search. And now let's have a look at the entire process. Again, we assume... BMW is looking for a new CFO. And BMW uh, engages Hytrick and Straddle to find the new CFO. We will always have the same process. It starts with uh, a kind of briefing. Yeah? Uh, the, consultant, the executive search consulting firm together with the executive board, uh, the CEO maybe, the, or the head of HR, they determine what are the requirements uh, the future candidate should meet to fill this position. Okay? So in other terms, you create a profile. Okay? And the next step is that um, jointly, the consulting firm together with the company, with its client, they think about what are relevant target companies. What is a target company? A target company is a company where you think you might find the right candidate. Now, when we think of BMW, what do you think? In which companies could you find the right CFO? Audi. Hmm? Audi. Audi, yeah. <coughs> Daimler, yeah. Porsche. And all the other companies in the, in the same industry, of course, yeah. But not necessarily. Yeah, can also be other companies. Yeah, at the end you have a list of let's say 30, 40 target companies where you think, well, well I think we can find the right candidate in this company, this company, this company. There is a term which is important: the so-called off limits. So when you deal with executive search, you have to understand this concept of off limit. <coughs> let's just think about the case that you work with Hytrick and Struggle, and you come to the point saying, well, Audi, Audi could be a good target company for us. Let's look whether we find the right candidate at Audi. If Audi is also a client of Hytrick and Struggle, Hytrick and Struggle will not, will not uh, uh, approach a candidate at Audi. Yeah? It's, it's a, a, an executive search Consul an ex executive search company will not help a client to fill positions and at the same time approach people there. Yeah? It's not allowed. They have certain agreements. So we at SAP, for instance, we engage executive search firms only to protect us from, this, from them. Yeah? Once they work for us, they will not be allowed to get in touch with our people. Yeah? This is what we name off-limit. Okay. So, then the candidate search starts. Uh, maybe, you know, okay, there is a target company. And we want to get in touch with the CFO of this target company. Okay? Sometimes say, well, beyond these target companies, we, we also screen the market. Maybe we find, we find a candidate somewhere else. And as I said, uh, these researchers, they use their databases, they use the internet, they use everything. 
their, their personal networks, of course, and they have strong networks. They use everything to find the right candidate. And this is sometimes special. Yeah? I mean, this is really a special business. And sometimes it can happen that, that executive search companies, even though they are quite serious, yeah, uh, they, they act in, uh, in, uh, in some strange way. So just think about uh, you want to get in touch with a CFO of a company where you don't know who the CFO is. Now just imagine you want to get in touch with the CFO of Audi, as we said, but you don't really know who that is. At Audi we probably know, but, but uh, just in case we don't know, how to get in touch with this person? Probably by pretending to be interested in someone you know and then get the information you need. Okay, you use your own networks to, to, to get in Yeah, probably get in touch with someone at Audi and you pretend to want that person. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's a good way, that's a good way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Or you use spies, you just have employees who are going to work for that company. Ah, yeah, I have spies, spies, yeah. Okay, you have employees working for this company and they have to spy, yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea, yeah. yeah probably they do this, probably they do this. They have cover stories, right? You, I mean, the easiest way is you, you, just, you just dial an extension of the company, not the zero, because once you dial the zero at the end, you, you will end the, the reception, yeah, and you, you can't get through. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you call into a company like, oh, you say, well, can I talk to your CFO? The lady, probably a lady, will ask you, uh, who are you? Uh, uh, is, is our CFO expecting you to call? Yeah, what's the matter? Uh, and if you don't really have clear reasons, yeah, you, you, will not put, be put, you will not put through. So you will have no chance to just call in. So you don't dial the zero. You dial any kind of extension. Okay, so and you don't know where you end up. So, hello, uh, I'm Mr. Pfister. Uh, where am I now? Uh, uh, okay, purchase. Uh, well, that's weird because it's, it's the third time I try to to talk to the CFO, and every time I, t I call in, I end up somewhere in the company. Is there anybody in this company who is able to put me through to the CFO? I tell you, it's important. Yeah. Oh no. Moment, uh, just please uh, put you through. <laughs> yes. It's uh, sometimes funny how they act. Uh. Okay, then you, 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 you get in touch with the CFO. Hello, this is Mr. Pfister. Um, can you speak? <laughs> they always must ask this question first. Can you speak? <laughs> Uh, can we sh should should we <coughs> should we call again in the evening? You can give me a private mobile, and I'll call you in the evening. It's about a position. I, I I'm not allowed to tell you the name of the company, but it's a big car manufacturer uh, headquartered in Munich. <laughs> huh? Okay, uh, and it's the it's the CFO position. Are you interested? Oh, mm -hmm. oh yes, yeah, sounds great. Let's talk in the evening. Okay, I'm gonna talk again. And the first, the first contact is about uh, uh, telling whether there is uh, there's interest, whether a candidate is really motivated to change his career. If this is the case, uh, they meet personally somewhere, yeah, in a hotel lobby in Paris, at a um, highway restaurant somewhere, okay. And if it's all fine. Uh, the executive search company will present some profiles of the most suitable candidates to the client. And the client, at the end, will decide whom to invite to the interview. In most cases, there are three candidates which they, which they select, and then they do a regular interview, yeah, as always. Yeah, check some references. Yeah, what's the reference? You check... Okay, this candidate has worked for, for Audi, for Bosch. Now maybe we can talk to his manager when he was at Bosch yeah, and just find out uh, whether he or she did well. This is a reference. Yeah. Also, executive search companies help the candidate to, 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 to negotiate the salary and the benefits, the stock options and all this stuff. Yeah. 
because they get one third of it, <laughs> right? Uh, in some companies, you have something like a sign-on bonus. A sign-on bonus, it's not only related to, to HR. A sign-on bonus is whenever contracts are signed. You know what that is? Um, okay, there is a candidate for the CFO position at BMW. And BMW and the candidate, they are close to sign the contract. And they meet, yeah? The candidate together with his wife or her husband or... You know, and there is the executive board, and uh, there's champagne, and now they sign. And before the candidate signs, says, "Well, I'm so happy uh, that I'm gonna work with you. Uh, it's so great. I totally look forward to working with you. But you know, mm, there's one thing. I have to relocate from Paderborn here to Munich, and you know, my boat, my house, and all this. You know." Uh, to make long story short, I would say you pay me 100,000 now, and I will sign. Mm -hmm. The CEO will say, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Give him the damn 100,000 and we are done, because I don't want to start this process again. Yeah? <laughs> this, is, this is a sign-on bonus. Yeah? Is that legal? I don't know. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that explained in any textbook? Probably not. Does it happen? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's so hard to find a qualified people for, for that specific job, and they already work in a company and probably earn well and all that, why should they um, do all this, like meeting and <coughs> an interview and then wait and blah, 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 aren't they in such a high position that you have to be like lucky if, so, if one of them is willing to change and you probably have to apply him right or her right now? Is, is it, are they really willing to go through the interview and meet and then probably talk to the former bosses or stuff like that? Yeah. So the question is, do these candidates are they really willing to go through all this process? If they are already on a high level, shouldn't be, they be happy? Yeah? Is that related to this question? Um, yeah, it's an answer. Possibly okay, answer. please, an answer. Here comes the um, answer. I, I suppose, because yeah. I, I know such a case. And sometimes also somebody in a very, very high position is unhappy because he's not being, he might do a really good job and have lots of benefits. Yeah. But on the other hand, he might not be happy with his job because he's not supported by the even higher bosses because maybe he's an export manager and he wants to expand the market for the company, but the company does not support him because they want to stay in right. Germany or whatever. Yeah. So he's very frustrated. You cannot assume that, that all managers on a certain level are happy. Yeah? These guys are ambitious. Yeah? And there is always something better. Always. Yeah? I would like to give an example. Yeah, please. Like Marisa May, the vice president of Google Communications, she was given the CEO position for Yahoo, mm -hmm. and she moved on. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's also for a career. You can stay in one place the whole time. You have to change jobs. Yeah. You you can you can you can uh, expand your experience. Yeah. You can expand your profile. Having uh, having spent time in different industries and in different countries and different mm -hmm. jobs, uh, that really uh, increases your <coughs> let's say market value. Good. Um, this was executive search. These are really the traditional ways. Ads, career fairs, executive search. We, we have had this approach uh, since decades. Yeah? And when we talk about these new ways of how companies hire people, how companies acquire talent, uh, this picture gives you an overview. And what I will do is I will talk about four building blocks. We will talk about employee value proposition, we will talk about active search strategies, we talk about candidate retention and positive candidate experience. These are in my eyes really the four <coughs> major building blocks companies intensively think about. Okay, so uh, what is target group definition? That relates to the question, what are our key and bottleneck functions, right? What are our key and, bo 
key functions, what are the bottleneck functions. And coming from there, we do all these four steps. Okay? So, what's the problem? Whom of you would like to work at a company like BMW? Who, who could imagine working at a company like BMW? Hmm? If the job is great, if salary is great, everything, who would like to work at BMW? Okay. Who would like to work at Festo? Okay. Festo? Who knows Festo? Okay. <laughs> Festo? is near Esslingen, which is near Stuttgart. It's a great company, a great employer. But the problem is, many people hardly know this company. So, so the point is, if people don't know the company, they will not apply there. Right? You would never apply at a company which you don't know. But even though you, you, you know the company. The question is, uh, would I love to work there? Is, 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 has this company a great image? I mean, we, we know a lot of companies out there, but they have a bad image. Uh, you remember Schlecker? Yeah. Bad image. Yeah. Even though you know this company, which is great in the first instance, you would not work there because company reputation is really bad. But even though company's reputation is great, yeah, is the reputation as employer also great? Yeah, that's the difference. The first thing is about the reputation of the company as such, but, but the employer image, yeah, is it really a great employer? That, that's a different question. But even though when the employer image is great, does this company really offer great jobs? So if you think, well, BMW, I know this company, no. great company, great employer even more. Do they really offer attractive jobs? Even though, would you apply then? Hmm. Uh, even if you apply, will you really go there once you get an offer? So what you see is there is a kind of funnel. And um, if employer image is bad, the proportion of those people that ultimately apply becomes less and less. Okay? So this is really a crucial point and this is crucial for many especially small and mid-sized companies out there. Festo. Yeah? Uh, Rena in Fortewangen. Great company. So successful. Technology leader. Who knows this company? Okay, so in the first step, the question is, what do people out there think about a company? Do they know the company? If this is not the case, then people will not apply. So this leads us to a topic which is really crucial, and many companies think about this. It's about building an employee value proposition, building an employer brand. So this is a key term, employer brand. So let's talk about this for, for some minutes. Um, here on this picture you will find some brands, right? I, I, guess you, I guess you all know these brands. Now, this is a marketing question. What is a brand? Huh. You should know what a brand is. Uh, even if you, if you don't know the exact definition, uh, how, how would you, in your own words, how would you define a brand? Yes. Right. Triggers a, uh, even an emotion yeah. in a person. You immediately think of what it stands for, what, how I stand. Wonderful, for wonderful. Yeah. A brand triggers something, some, some ideas, emotional ideas, functional ideas. Some things come to your mind immediately when you think about, once you think about a brand. Right? And this is intentional. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So let, let's have some example here. Red Bull. You all know Red Bull? Red Bull is about all those things teachers hate. Yeah? The conservatives. Red Bull is about crazy stuff, doing crazy things. Yeah? I mean, Red Bull, the product, that's something you can drink. And 
that has to do with nothing with any emotion. But Red Bull is linked to some special ideas doing crazy things, right? Uh, the same is with Marlboro. Marlboro is about freedom and adventure. Uh, and now with a new campaign, being something, don't be a maybe, yeah? But sorry, we talk about cigarettes. Cigarettes have no link to any emotion or something else. It's just cigarettes. But what companies try to do is they link the name, the logo, with some ideas. Nivea is about care. Puma is about sportive lifestyle, right? Could you wear Puma, uh, Puma clothes in a, at a party? No? Yes, you can. <laughs> can you wear Adidas at a party? No. Uh, uh, Puma, a Puma boutique, a Puma store is like a boutique, yeah? while an Adidas store is like a sports store. SAP is about reliability, innovation. Apple is about design, innovation. H&M is about what? <laughs> cheap, 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 cheap <laughs> fashion, young. Right? It's different from Hugo Boss. So you see, every brand is linked to something, and this is intentional. The companies have invested a lot of money <coughs> to link their name, the logo, to some very concrete ideas, and I would like to, 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 to put it a little bit further. It's about a promise. A brand is about a promise. If you buy an Apple product, you have the product with the best design, uh, the most innovative uh, uh, product. That's the promise. If this is true or not, you decide as a customer. But that at least is what the company wants to, how, how the company wants to be seen and how the product should be seen um, so this is about product brand. It has nothing to do with HR, right? It's, it's about the product, it's about the company, and on the left-hand side here, you find these typical dimensions uh, uh, which, we, which we can look at when we talk about product brands or company brands. It could be about price, could be about quality, could be about design, innovation, prestige, and so on. So this is product brand. Promise related to the product. On the right side, that's a different story. So the question here is, why should I eat something at McDonald's? Why should I buy an Apple product? Why should I, buy, uh, why should I go for a Mercedes? But here, it's about the question, why should I work at McDonald's? Why should I work at Apple? And here, the dimensions are different totally different things you need to consider. So, of course, there are also the products that come into play. Some people would like to work at Porsche because they like, like the products. Some would like to work at, I don't know, at Gucci because they like the product. But many people would like to work at Gucci because to have interesting tasks or, or you, 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 you get some offers like career opportunities, free lunch, a company car, great salary. Some people would like to work at a certain company because the people there are great, they are highly qualified, they are smart. Some people would like to work at a company because they share some relevant values. Yeah, You'd like to work with a company because the people there, they trust each other, they have fun, <laughs> they are open-minded. So on the right-hand side, you see typical dimensions that rather relate to, to employers. So please see the difference. When we talk about products, we talk about different dimensions than when we talk about employers. Now, what's the point? Think about any company you like. Yeah. Really, any company you like. And think about the question, what should they promise on their let's say, career website. Yeah? You know, companies have career websites. That's their part of the website, which is about careers and job opportunities. As an exercise, I would like to invite you to, to visit some career websites. Go to the career website of Google. Go to the career website of IBM, of Lufthansa, and so on. And the question is, what do they promise there? 
It's not about the product. It's about how is it to work there. And now many companies think about what should we promise. On the product side, it's clear. For Apple, it's clear what they promise. Yeah? Innovation, design. But what do they promise once it comes to the question, why should somebody work there? Yeah? In recent years, I have worked with many companies just figuring this out. What should be the promise as employer? Now, how do you come to this promise? What should Apple write on the career website? What should Mercedes write on the career website? Deutsche Bahn, Deutsche Bank, Allianz, Microsoft. What should they write on the career website? And how do you come to this? So here you find the entire process that you're going to talk about. So just imagine I'm, I'm the representative of a company. Yeah? Any kind of company. Let's say I'm the representative of PricewaterhouseCoopers. And you are my target group. If I would be uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, you indeed would be my target group. They are really interested in people like you. So once I have understood that I want to achieve, I, I want to reach you, I want to attract you, the next thing I will do, and I'll talk about this for a minute, is I would like to understand how am I seen in your eyes, PricewaterhouseCoopers? How am I seen in your eyes? What is important to you? What can I offer? And what do the others offer? Once I have understood all this, after I have done this analysis, I define a strategy, which is a clear promise. We talk about these things in a while. And then I build my campaigns around this. So what I would like you to take home for the moment is, when companies think about what to promise on the job ad, what to promise on the career website, it's not that they just instantly think, oh yes, let's write a career opportunity, let's write great salary. No, it's a process. It's a project. And companies really systematically think about what to promise. And the variety of things you can promise is huge. Yeah? This, this is, this is uh, a kind of it's, it's, it's not a complete list, but there you will find a lot of arguments companies can use. They could say, well, we offer career opportunities. You can balance your private life and work. Or here, it's a secure workplace, what we can offer. Uh, we are technology leaders. Our products are leading products with leading technology. We are diverse. Yeah, you will find all kinds of people in our company. Um, we have a great company culture. Um, we do things that make sense, yeah? not only for customers, but for the planet. I mean, every point you find is attractive and it's, it's great. Yeah? And again, the question is, if I am PricewaterhouseCoopers, if I am McDonald's, if I am Mercedes, if I am Hugo Boss, what should I pick from this list? Yeah, what should I pick from this list? Yeah. To come up with a promise at the end. Like Ernst Shackleton has done many, many years ago. This is a promise. Yeah. Man wanted. By the way, this would not be allowed today. It's, it's, not, it's not appropriate because of <coughs> equal opportunities. He prefers man. <laughs> man wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long month of complete darkness, constant danger. A great promise, huh? <laughs> uh, safe return, doubtful, honor recognition in case of success. That's the most important point in the end. Honor recognition in case of success. He got a lot of application. That was a so powerful employee value proposition. Yeah? This is a model one from a company. I don't care what you think about this company, but that's their promise taken from their career website, Goldman Sachs. They just said, why should I work someone with us? Simple, because teamwork, meritocracy, global impact, excellence, diversity, opportunity. To the point. That is, uh, 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 together with this picture, you, you must know 
It took a long process to pick these few terms because most terms are not there. It's not about career. It's not about salary. It's not about work-life balance. It's, it's about these things. How do they get to these points? How? That's the question. So I would like to explain, and this is a very uh, critical picture. I really want you to understand this. Uh, this is a fundamental logic of how companies build their employee value proposition. What is again the employee value proposition? It's like the unique selling proposition. It's the argument a company brings up to the question, why should somebody work with us? Yeah? Okay? So, the first thing a company does is they think about what can we offer? Where are we strong? Now, you can think about a company like McDonald's. What can a company like McDonald's offer? Question first, who would like to work at McDonald's? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> but, nevertheless, what can a company like McDonald's offer? Why is, why is McDonald's maybe an attractive employer? Job security. McDonald's will still exist next year, right? Or in 10 years. While with other companies, you, you can't be sure about this. Career opportunities. Career opportunities. I mean, this is, a, this is a global corporation. They have a lot of opportunities. You have a lot of career opportunities there. Yeah, I like to say that they were global in Africa. All yeah, over the they are also. global. They are everywhere. So there are a couple of things where McDonald's is strong, no doubt about it. And if you talk to the people there, if you talk with the employees, they will name a lot of things. But once you have understood all these things, career opportunities, global presence, <coughs> security, would you name all these things on the career website? No, you would not. Why? Because the answer is on the slide. Right? Because not all these things are relevant to you. I mean, you are a target group of McDonald's. Yeah? Not everything is relevant to you. Right? If you, for instance, you want, to, you want to attract engineers, we know what engineers want. They want the newest technology they work on. They want complicated problems they can, they, they can solve. They like to work in an atmosphere which is a little bit cozy, yeah, yeah, like each other, oh, we are a family, yeah. They don't care about location, yeah. Engineers don't care about work time, <laughs> most of them. Yeah. So not everything a company can offer is really relevant to the target group. Here we talk about the target group preferences. What is important to the people I want to, want to attract? And then even more, you find a lot of points where other companies, the competitors in the labor market, are equally strong. You know? Um, I mean, McDonald's is not the only company that is global. Mac McDonald's is not the only company that can offer secure workplaces. There are also others. So the question is at the end, where are we strong? What can we really tell in a authentic way. Yeah? Where can we do a promise that we can really that 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 that, uh, that, that, that is real? But what is important also for those people who want to attract and where are we different from the others? So at the end, here on this picture, A and E are the only points where we are strong, where we can meet the preferences of the target group and where the competitors are weak. Okay, this is a very simple idea. So, McDonald's, in fact, they have went through such a process. And this can mean work, uh, uh, weeks, of, week, weeks of work. It's not that you do this exercise in, in, in a small workshop. That's, that's a project to do something like this. So, they came up at the end with one single employee value proposition. One single. 
which is, I have an example here, which is about opportunities. It's about career opportunities. So, go to the career website of McDonald's, visit some McDonald's restaurant, even though you don't eat there, I don't care. Yeah? Look at the campaign they do. And you will see that everything they promise as employer, as employer, not with regard to their product, as employer, everything is about opportunities. Yeah? Okay? So, uh, what I would like you to take home is that companies try to find the one single argument why they are a great employer and there is a process behind, there is a, 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 a system behind to find the right point. And here we have McDonald's uh, with one single argument. If you look at other companies like, let's say, IBM. IBM does not promise great salary. IBM does not promise work-life balance. What IBM uh, is offering is you can solve great problems that are relevant for the planet. Yeah? You can work on the big stuff. Yeah? So every company that, that has went through such a process has this one single argument. What we're going to talk about later on in the, in the next course is that now the question is, once you have understood this one single argument, how can you communicate these things? I want to talk about this only for, for, for a few minutes because most things are clear. <coughs> of course, companies have company presentation. If somebody from McDonald's shows up here at the university, he or she will present something about career opportunities. You can go to the career website, you will find things about opportunities. Also, they have career fairs. On, on print media, they have ads. Yeah. Um, or you will find YouTube videos from McDonald's uh, uh, about why is it great to work there. So you have a lot of channels, mm -hmm. communication channels, media channels, uh, companies can use to communicate to their target group. Okay? Why we talk about next course, as mentioned uh, earlier, we talk about social media as well. So more and more companies also use social media, blogs, Twitter, but especially Facebook. Yeah? If you look at the McDonald's Facebook page, you will find a lot about career opportunities. So uh, this is the idea. I put it really short here. The idea is once I have understood the key arguments, once I have understood my employee value proposition, then I translate this into my campaigns, into the way I communicate to the target group. Okay? So, next step. Active sourcing strategies. What is that? The first thing I would like you to understand is that when you look at the labor market, Arbeitsmarkt, you will find three different types of people. Three. You will find people that are non-seekers. What is a non-seeker? A non-seeker is a person that is not interested at all in any new career opportunity. Yeah? They don't care. I'm a non-seeker, really. I'm, I really I can, I'm truly happy with my current job. I love what I do. I love this faculty. Yeah? I love to teach. So I, there's no interest in all at all in changing something. They can come, any company in the world can offer me a great job as, let's say, an HR director or so. I would reject. Really. So I'm a non-seeker. I don't read any job ad. I don't visit career fairs. I don't, I, I don't visit any career website because I'm simply not interested. And there are other people as well, people that are close to retirement, or people that just have started a new job. People that are not interested in any job opportunity now. Okay? Then, we have other people, the so-called active seekers. 
These are people that are kind of, let's say, desperate. <laughs> yeah. Maybe unemployed. They can't stand to stay with their current employer. Maybe they hate their job. They hate their boss. They need a new job. You are close to graduation, still having the job. Yeah? You actively search for job. You visit career fairs. You look at job ads. You do a lot to find a job. So, in between, there is a third group which is highly relevant. The passive candidates. Passive candidates. What is a passive candidate? Yeah, there are a lot of people out there which have a job. They are fine, more or less. Yeah. They don't visit career fairs. They don't read job ads. But they are open. Yeah. They could imagine once there is an attractive job offer coming from somewhere, they start to think. Yeah. So they don't actively search for a job. It's not that they are not interested at all in any career <coughs> opportunity. They're just open passively. Right? So this differentiation, differentiation is key. And why is it key? Two reasons. Question to you. Overall, what do you think? Uh, which people are more qualified? The <laughs> passive candidates or the active seekers? <laughs> Sorry? The passive. The passive. In general. Yeah. In general. Yeah. That does not apply for any individual case, of course. But in general, we can assume this because if I do well, if I am successful in my job, in brackets, I'm qualified. Yeah? I get a lot of offers. I don't have to put too much effort in finding a different career opportunities. Yeah? The better I am, the more passive I can be. Yeah? It's like in daily life. You know, if you are attractive, yeah, physically, you can be very passive on the party. Just sit there and let the guy to come. Yeah? Yeah? The better you are, the more passive you can be. That's a simple rule. The second implication from this is, if the best people are passive and you want to reach them, you as employer have to become active. Right? If they don't read ads, if they don't show up on a career fair, you can forget about all this traditional stuff. You have to, you have to approach them, you have to find them, you have to walk towards them. So this is what we mean by active sourcing, doing something active. Yeah? A job ad is passive, right? Because I just post an ad as a company and then I lay back and I wait, the, wait for the applications to come. That's passive. Yeah? Even career fairs are passive as I have shown you. You are on a career fair as a company, you are at the booth, at your stand and you just wait for the people to come. Yeah? It's not that you move towards the people, you wait. Yeah? So whenever you wait or let somebody else do the job, the executive search consultants, then this is rather passive. Here in this picture you will find some active as well as passive approaches. On the bottom left-hand side, you find the passive things. Job ads, as I've said, executive search, career fairs, and all this stuff. The more we move to the top, to the right-hand side, things become more active. Why? The more we go to the top, the methods become more competitive, yeah? aggressive. Yeah. We'll talk about some ideas here. Um, probably I have to explain this dimension, the line engagement. What is that? Line engagement. That's maybe uh, an HR term. You know, in some companies, 
all this talent acquisition stuff, all this recruiting stuff, is only done by the HR department. In some other companies, all that talent acquisition stuff is done not only by HR, but it's done by both HR and the managers and the employees. I know a lot of companies where the managers have a great responsibility in hiring people. So the more, it, the more managers and employees outside HR are engaged, yeah, the more we talk about line engagement. Okay? So to me, that's a very important dimension when we talk about active sourcing. Okay, so what I would like to do now is I would like to pick out some of these uh, methods and like to talk about it for a minute. And we start with, uh, with an approach which you should know. It's campus recruiting. Yeah? Campus recruiting. You can imagine what that is. Yeah? I mean, we have a lot of companies that show up here. I would like to get in touch with you. But what we find is that still many companies are kind of passive in that, in that uh, sense. That they just post posters somewhere or they have a booth on the, on the uh, industry day as we name it. Yeah, this university career fair is still passive. I get mails from companies saying, Dear Professor Trost, uh, please find attached the job ad please print it and post it somewhere. <laughs> Sometimes I do this. <laughs> Some ask, please, please post it on Facebook. Uh, this is still passive. I would like to, to show you what real campus recruiting means. And, and you will tell that there are already some companies that do quite well here in approaching you as a target group. So the first thing is that companies think about with which universities they should work with. Yeah? Should a company like Bosch work with a Fort Wang University? Hmm? Yes, why? Because it's a very technical uh, university yes. and qualified and it's a faculty, so it's yeah. not like a big university. There are some reasons why a boy should work with us because the students, yeah, they fit to their requirements with regards to the curricula, to what they learn, engineers, business, that really fits. We have a good reputation. Uh, from a Stuttgart perspective, we are quite near. Yeah. Are there some other reasons? English. Sorry? English. Yes. English. A company like Bosch is international and they, they require that the graduates are internationally minded and speak English at least. So that fits. Also if you compare a normal university to a Fachhochschule it's much more practical. Yeah. Than yeah. We are a university of applied science. It's much more practical. We are much more close to the real world so to speak. Yeah. So the question for every company doing campus recruiting is what are the few universities and faculties we should work with. Yeah? And these we name target universities. I know a lot of companies that work with hundreds of universities. Yeah, they tell, at least they tell me, oh, we work with hundreds of universities. But that can't be. If you have limited resources, you have to focus on just a few and then do it right. Yeah? So for every good campus recruiting, the idea is to be focused, to focus on a very few faculties. And here you use certain criteria. What do you do then? And that's the second building block of a good campus recruiting. It is to build relationships. To whom? To professors. To, to you. To some career centers. To the president, maybe build relationships. Yeah? It's all about relationships. Uh, we already have some companies here. Uh, let's think about a company like Hans Kohl yeah, in Schiltach. We have a personal relation really 
They know us, we know them. They do things for us, we do things for them. It's really a give and take. It's, 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 like, it's partnering. Yeah, it's not that they just come over and post a poster somewhere. It's really that we talk about it, we talk to each other. What can we do for you? What can they do for us? And, and that's a very, very good personal relationship. And that's the, that's the foundation for everything you do then. Yeah? Uh, what can you do? Of course, here I've mentioned some marketing activities. Yeah? So you know what this is. Doing, offering internships, offering theses, posting posters, award theses, and all this stuff. You know this stuff. You should know this. <laughs> you are the target group. Yeah? But what I just want to say is that a good campus recruiting consists of all these three building blocks. Having a real focus on a few target universities, building good relationships, and then, based on this foundation, having very concrete activities. Okay? Now, next point. Talk about networks. Networks. In talent acquisition, networks became so crucial. Really crucial. <coughs> First, what you need to know, what you need to understand is this idea of A player, no A player. Yeah? It's not that a player knows a player. Yeah? A player, no A player. What is an A player? We differentiate sometimes between A players, B players, and C players. A players are the best. B players are the middle, right? C players are the losers, yeah, so to speak. Talk about A players. The strongest people know other strong people. That's the idea. And that's true. We know that from research. Um, if you marry sometimes, probably the intelligence level of your partner is more or less equal to your own and that makes sense <laughs> yeah, if you have a partner that is much more intelligent than you then you, you will face hard times yeah? if the intelligent level of your partner is significantly lower than yours you also will face hard times so the best thing you can do is having a partner with an intelligent level uh, which is more or less equal to your the same with attitude, the same with, with physical uh, attraction. So, what we tend to do as, as human beings is we try to build relationships to people that are equal to ourselves, more or less. Okay. So, the idea is once you have great people in your company, <laughs> they probably know other people that are great with a similar mindset, mindset you know, with similar attitudes. A similar work style. Yeah? It's like, like saying, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Yeah? So we have, in the inner circle, we have, we have employees. Right? And here is one employee, of course, an employee has relations to colleagues. An employee knows his or her colleagues. And these colleagues, all of myself, I have relations to people outside the company. There are people outside the company which I know. <laughs> yeah? And there are even more people that, that I know very, let's say, it's, 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 it's kind of, we, we name it a weak tie. People which I know, but they are not friends. You haven't seen them for a while, but still people they know. I think 80% of your friends on Facebook are weak ties. You know, are people which, yeah, you have met them sometimes, but you don't have regular conversation. You're even not sure if you, if, you, if you will meet these people again in your life, but they are there, and you know them. So, what we know is that when we take all this, <coughs> sorry, when we take all this together, people have huge networks. Yeah, we have huge networks. And uh, there is this law that that the, the, the law of the small world that every person knows every other person in the world 
by at least six instances. So you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows the Pope. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know that from research that this really applies. You know everyone in the world by a very few instances. The, the networks are really powerful. And companies understand this. And they understand that especially these weak ties are important. Yeah? There are so many people I know somehow. People I have drank a beer with sometimes in my life. And there is already a, a little level of trust. Yeah? So, what we find in companies is that because they know this, because they know about the, the, the strength of networks, they use these networks, they make use of it, and use so-called employee referral programs. Um, what is an employee referral program? That's a very fundamental idea. Um, I'm an employee, and as I said, as employee, I know other people. So I refer to somebody outside the company, a former colleague, a friend, a weak tie, yeah, somebody I've met two years ago somewhere, uh, but, but where I still have good memories. Yeah? I recommend this person, and once this recommended person, the one I refer to, is hired, to the company I work with, I get some bonus. Yeah? That's the idea of employee referral programs. Right? And that's very powerful. I did a study around this in Germany. More and more companies use this idea. Um, in, the, in, the, in the rather qualified area, the senior area, um, 50 years work experience plus the bonus is about 1,500, yeah? Just for recommending somebody, once, once the person you have recommended is, is hired, you get 1,500 1, euro, that's the average. In some companies, you get 4,000 euros. At Adidas, you have a chance to win a Vespa, yeah? So companies do a lot, yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> to, 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 to engage their people to recommend others. Yeah? Okay? Another, another approach which we name social community recruiting is simply using LinkedIn. So, you all know LinkedIn? Yeah. Uh, there's a German version of it which is Xing. Who is on LinkedIn? Okay, so we can become friends there if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Constantly collecting contacts there. Uh, who is on Xing, the f German version? Okay. I, I would guess that at the end of your study, 90% will be there. Yeah, and that's, these are these platforms where you really can share your contacts, where you post your, your CV. Yeah. Uh, and what companies do is they, 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 they use these platforms to find people. So this is active. Right? It's not that you search for jobs on a job board and then apply. <coughs> it's vice versa. <coughs> companies look for people and get in touch with them. So I type in at LinkedIn, human resource, postal code 72072. Which is the region around tubing and where I live. So I find a lot of people, yeah? mainly students <laughs> or former students. Yeah? I find Mona Babolik. Uh, I was the supervisor of the thesis. I click on her uh, link and then I find the entire CV and everything. And what I can do then is I simply get in touch with her. Hello, Mona, I have an interesting job. Yeah. Um, would you like to know learn more? So I have access to millions of profiles, not only to my friends. So these are my friends, which are shown in the first place. But the 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 the, 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 
The more I go down to this list, I find people which I only know in the second instant, uh, and so on. I find millions of people, and I can get in touch with these, and companies do this. They use this very intensively. Okay? That's what we name social community recruiting. Okay? So far we spoke about campus recruiting, employee referral, social community recruiting. So now we can, we can jump a little bit to the, to the top, look at some other active ways. And um, one interesting, of course, is what we name guerrilla recruiting. Guerrilla, what does that stand for? We also know other things like guerrilla marketing. Yeah? What is that, guerrilla? What does that mean? Intense? Yeah? It's so to say unorganized, unauthorized war. Unauthorized. Basically, yeah. basically so it's, I suppose, what we talked about two weeks ago, like going to companies and stealing employees, maybe? Stealing employees. <laughs> okay. Or something. What's Doing bad mean? things. Oh, horrible. Ah. <laughs> yeah, it's something like this, yeah. It's maybe the Lady Gaga of recruiting. Yeah, the Lady Gaga of recruiting. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, yes, it's, it's about but stop, s stop spreading uh, giveaways on a fair, doing this boring stuff, sharing brochures. I mean, brochures. Eh? Do you stand up in the morning to get brochures? No. Uh, it's, it's about doing th something that is special, that is... Maybe not allowed, yeah, yeah. Maybe something that is that is beyond good taste. Maybe so. Having an example here, there is an agency, a creative agency named Butter, like butter. It's the name of this agency located in Düsseldorf, Germany, and they have really a, a significant demand for uh, qualified creatives, creative designers. And they struggled so much that they thought about having a special campaign. So there is an annual award of the Art Directors Club. It's the award, the, the Oscar in marketing, so to speak. Two and a half thousand people show up there, suited well. Yeah, it's really the leading event in marketing. What is it called? Art Directors Club. Um, and on this award, Butter, this agency, they have they took one employee and one employee jumped on the stage, yeah, as a pleasure, yeah, totally naked, uh, just wearing shoes. And on his breast there was written Butter sucht kreative mit Eiern. <laughs> yeah. Butter is looking for creatives with balls of steel. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's bad taste. Yeah. Uh, I, I would not recommend doing something like this for every company. <laughs> hey, that's... <laughs> But the idea is that the budget for this, for this campaign was really low. Uh, they, they, they say that it just costed an entrance ticket and courage. Yeah? But the impact was great. Yeah? They were on TV, they were on newspaper, they, 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 they got hundreds of applications then. So this was successful. Huh? Low cost, high impact. That's guerrilla. Low cost, high impact. And that's accompanied with doing things that are a little bit beyond good taste, maybe. Yeah, that's uh, very close to legal limitations. Yeah. Another example here is there was a company, also a creative agency. They, they, have, they have sprayed... Mm -hmm internet addresses, URLs, on the, f on, the, on the entrance floor of their competitors. Yeah? <laughs> www.alleswirdallesbesser.com Doesn't matter what that means, but 
I mean, if you are an employee and you, you come to work, and on the entrance there is a, a URL sprayed on the floor, the first thing is you 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 you, you, you take your smartphone and you type this in, yeah, this internet <laughs> address, and then a, a website appears that describes a typical bad situation in most uh, agencies. Low salary, pressure, bad leadership style, all this stuff, and suddenly a pop-up shows up. Yeah? Please quit now and take the advantage of the early applicant. <laughs> so, I mean, that's also bad. Yeah? The competitors didn't like this campaign, of course. <laughs> but, what I just want to show you is that there are more and more companies doing this active type of sourcing. This is something different than just using ads. Yeah? This is active in a sense that it's, it's more aggressive. And we will find more and more examples in the future. And, and what I do, what I do <coughs> sometimes is I do workshop with companies yeah? uh, where I spend half a day or an entire day with people like you. And what we do in these workshops is we just think about ideas like this. So companies are more and more desperate in a way that they really seek for good ideas. And you will not get the good ideas from the HR department. You get the best ideas from the target group. Doing workshops, thinking about what can we do. Because there is a universe of good ideas out there. Powerful ideas. And again, these really go beyond the boring job ad. So, this was the second building block. The first one, employee value proposition. The next one was active sourcing. And now we come to the third building block of talent acquisition, which is candidate retention. So, if you do an internship at a company like yeah, again, PricewaterhouseCooper or Allianz or Bosch. If you do an internship there, at the end, there will be a kind of evaluation. You will be evaluated. Are you an A, B or C player? And what you see on this picture is simply a, a scheme that some companies use. It's just an example. Some companies think Okay, you have done an internship there. Wonderful. Are you somebody who could be relevant for a key or bottleneck function? Yeah? Do you remember the strategic functions? The ones where you have a significant demand but <coughs> hard to be filled? Are you a person that will succeed in the future? Will you Go your way. Will you grow? Will you, be, will you be really strong in the future? You can tell it sometimes by young people, by students like you. You work with students for half a year and you can really tell, how will this person be in five years? You, you, you cannot predict it very precisely, but you can tell, well, this person, this person will really succeed and this person, maybe. Yeah? So, if you think a student has really a very high potential, will be successful in the future, and it will be relevant for one of our key or bottleneck functions, then this intern will be evaluated as a, a candidate. The others are evaluated as a C candidate. So all interns, really, believe me, all interns in the big corporations, they evaluate their interns at the end. And you will be classified into one of these segments. If you are lucky and you are evaluated as an A player, you will benefit from some offers. Yeah? You will find benefits that are shown here on the right-hand side. Maybe you get some invitations to breakfast with the CEO. You like it, yeah? Vorstandsvorsitzende. Would you like to have breakfast with the CEO of Deutsche Bank? No. Yeah. Oh my God. Would you like to have breakfast with the CEO of McDonald's? Who's that? Would you like to do breakfast with the CEO of Microsoft? 
definitely. I mean, for some people that really means something. It's not that you sit alone with a CEO. It's a group of people and you share things, you get a presentation, you talk about ideas. I mean, that could be a really good experience. You get attractive job offers. You are in regular contact with managers. Yeah. Um, I mean, at Price Price Waterhouse Cooper, for instance, if you, I want to stick to this example, they have invited their A players to a sailing trip for two days. Yeah. Uh, how do we name this? A Seagate. You know, the Seagate uh, scooter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the name? Jet ski. Jet ski. No, not on the water. It's on these two wheels. Segway. Segway. Oh. Segway. Oh. They, they made a Segway trip to, uh, through Hamburg. Yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah. Things like this. If you are only a C player, if you are classified into this particular segment, you get newsletters. <laughs> you get an uh, email uh, at your birthday or on Christmas. What do companies do? What is the idea? The idea is, as I've shown also in, on, on this picture, the idea is that. Uh, you classify the people and you what, would like to retain these people because once you, have once, once you have finished your study these companies they want to hire you especially when you are an A player if you are a B player they would like to hire you if you are a C player then maybe yeah? but what they do is they, they build a relationship to you they would like to keep in touch with you yeah and that's what we name candidate retention <coughs> candidate retention to retain retain candidates yeah okay this is not only for this is not only for uh, former interns this is all uh, uh, also <coughs> for former uh, related to apprenticeships for instance or companies meet people wherever they meet them, on congresses. Companies meet people in the recruiting process. Some companies have the so-called second best. You know, in former days, when a company had two strong applicants for one single job, had two candidates for one single job, and both candidates are well qualified, they took one and rejected the other. And to the other, they said, Okay, candidate, you are also strong, but we have to take the other. So, goodbye. Good luck. That was the old day. In the new day, they will say, okay, we had to take the other, but let's keep in touch. We will find something for you. Okay? They put this guy into the talent pool. A pool. Let's say a database, okay? And with the people in this database, the talent pool, they do regular things, as I said, in, invite them to, to, to events, uh, send a letter at the birthday, uh, sending gifts. Yeah? So this is the new way, keeping in touch with promising candidates. The fourth building block, I don't want to say too much about. Uh, whom of you was already in a job interview? Let's say for internship or apprenticeship, okay? So how was it? Did you like it? Was it a nightmare? How were you treated? The question is really, and this is what I also tell to the companies outside, is it's not that the company decides whom to hire. That was the old day. In the old day, a company had a lot of applicants and you simply select the best one. You were in a situation where you, there were more applicants, more qualified applicants than jobs. So I were in a, in the, in a comfortable situation as a company to simply select. Oh, I take you, you. Today, we have more jobs than applicants. So who decides? It's not the company who decides only. It's the candidate who decides. The candidate decides, will I work with you or do I work at Google? I have a lot of opportunities. You, if, you do, if, you are, if you succeed in your study, 
if you have good grades, you have international experience, if you show a positive personality, whatever that means, you will have opportunities, really. I promise you. You will have opportunities. You can select. You make the decision. Okay? So if the candidate is the one who does the decision, you must treat him or her well. <laughs> right? So what I would like you to do is go to the website of companies like BMW, Daimler, or somewhere else and try to apply with a fake name, of course. Yeah? Act like an applicant. Apply at Daimler. Yeah? Take another name, Barack Obama, yeah? <laughs> George Clooney, and you apply. And then think about your, the experience you make. And uh, it's about three things. It's about speed. Is the company fast in the response? Does the company really give you timely feedback? Yeah. Uh, so this is very important, speed. The other thing is transparency. Do you always know about the status of your application? I mean, all of you who have applied already somewhere, you know about this uncertainty. Well, now I have applied. I were at the interview. I don't know about the next step. When do I get a feedback? Why the hell am I invited to this second interview? I already were there. Yeah? So this is about transparency. Do I really know what's going on in the recruiting process? And the third thing is about appreciation. Wertschätzung. Do they treat you well? Yeah? It's about respect. It's about being friendly. I mean, really, when I look at practices in some companies, you can easily tell who is the candidate, who is the interviewer. You can tell it by the size of the chair. Yeah. The interviewer. <laughs> The candidate. Yeah. You go there, you're happy if you get a coffee. Yeah? <laughs> Hopefully, the company is in time. Maybe the interviewer asks you silly questions. What is your biggest weakness? Mm. Hey, come on. Yeah? <laughs> you are there as a candidate. They know everything about you because they have your application. You know nothing about that. That's not appropriate. Yeah? So why do, you, why do you have to go to the company side to do the interview? Why don't they come to your home? I'm sorry. <laughs> you can meet in the middle. You laugh, but, but sorry. Those companies that have understood that if you treat the candidate well, yeah, they win. Yeah? I know companies where you drive to the parking lot, you have an interview there, you drive to the parking lot, and there is a place on the parking lot reserved for you. Welcome, Stefan. Yeah? You go to the entrance, we welcome Stefan. Yeah? Welcome to the interview. Yeah? The question is whether you like this. Uh, uh, but, and, now, and then somebody comes, shakes in. Oh, you must be Stefan. Welcome. It's nice to, nice to have you here. There's all these little things. These little things that really make a difference. So, so what I really want you to take home is companies must do a lot in the future. Have a strong employee value proposition. Have active sourcing strategies. Retain the most promising candidates. But moreover... It's about something very simple. It's to provide the candidate with a positive experience. Candidate experience. Yeah? And this positive candidate experience is about speed, transparency, and appreciation. That's really simple. You don't have to study business to understand this. But I have to add this because it's, it's uh, so crucial. Right? Okay. So this is a little bit of overview about talent acquisition.